uh, maybe look at it uh, in a different uh, way, a different light. And I do appreciate Laura and Justin and Tanita and, and Tina and, you know, Brother Ralph and everybody that comes to sing in the choir. This church has a gift of music, and uh, God uses it to minister to people. And it's just so much appreciated. Appreciate everything that's said and done here. But, you know, if you can't sing and you don't play any instruments and uh, that type thing, then you really just stand back in appreciation of those who have that talent, who God's blessed with that. So I sure appreciate them. If you have your place in the book of uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read just a couple of verses here. Uh, this scripture will be very familiar to you. Uh, and I uh, hope we can break a simple message to you this evening that will be a blessing and an encouragement. But uh, God wrote this in 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning at the first verse. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods, little g with an s, do to me and more also, if I, if I make not thy life as one of them uh, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, Elijah, he arose and he went for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came and he sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then the angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon upon coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat, and he drink, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came unto him a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Now let us pray. Lord, I thank you for the privilege to be here this evening in the pulpit of Bible Way Baptist Church. God, there's not a person here tonight who came to hear what I have to say, but every one of them gathered that they might hear what you have to say. Lord, we just pray that that message will come forward tonight. And Lord, that you'll just bless and encourage and challenge. Lord, you just work in the hearts of your people each one of us individually, as we have need of. God, we love you, and that's why we're here tonight. And we trust you, Lord, which is why we look into your word to see what your expectations and your exaltations are for us. Lord, work through the word, these things we pray tonight. Amen. You might be seated. And I want to bring a simple message tonight on the juniper tree. About a month ago, uh, when we traveled to Honduras, uh, the timing was off by a couple of hours, and, and I'm not really one that sleeps in anyways. Uh, so I w was, was getting up in the morning, and it was a real precious time because I had a time uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, team house they had for us to stay in uh, was, uh, was quite large. Uh, there was a lot of big setting areas and tables and that kind of thing. So I had a lot of time to spend by myself. And this thought came to me as I was reading through God's word about the men who have served God and about the challenges that they have faced. And I was reading about Elijah and this one time in his life when he faced significant discouragement. Yes, you think about all of the things that uh, Elijah had done. What a great prophet of God that he was. And in fact, just before this, he had performed one of the greatest spiritual miracles that's recorded in the Word of God. He spoke out against the prophets of Baal. He spoke out against false religion. He challenged them, as it were, to a contest. And when it was all said and done, God had spoken from heaven. God's people recognized who he was and revered him. And uh, the prophets of Baal had been dealt with once and for all. And yet the Bible tells us here, that after all of that great victory, all of these miracles and all of the power that uh, God had, had allowed Elijah to call down from heaven, Elijah came to a place in his life where he was vulnerable. Yeah. Let me say that again. He came to a place in his life where he was vulnerable. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands because I'd have to get mine up first, but I wonder how many of us, even right now, certainly in recent past, have been in a place in your life where you were vulnerable. Now, I want you to look tonight at this person of Elijah. I want us to look tonight at the pain that brought him to this place. 
I want us to look at the place itself, and I want to look at the plan that God had. Now, the first thing is we see Elijah. Elijah was not just a prophet. He was not just a preacher. He was a man that God had his hand significantly upon. Amen? I think it's amazing that Elijah appeared, the first mention of him, it's just a couple of chapters before this. Uh, it's in uh, uh, 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. We won't turn there. But uh, we see that God had sent Elijah to begin to deal with, with Ahab. Ahab was the son of Omrah, and uh, Omrah was uh, a wicked man, and Ahab took that to a new level. Uh, Ahab was not afraid to, uh, to, to promote uh, uh, idolatry and, and false worship. And God sent uh, Elijah down that he would begin to uh, judge him that he would begin to deal with him. And the very first uh, mention that we see of Elijah is in 1 Kings, the 17th chapter. The first time he's mentioned is in the first verse, and it says that Elijah the Tishbite, uh, who, was, uh, uh, who was of the habits of uh, Gilead, said unto Ahab, and I love this. You talk about a man that God is using. His first mention in the scripture is to the king, and he says, as the Lord, uh, uh, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these days, but according to my word. When you talk about a person, you're talking about a strong and powerful and a spiritually focused man in Elijah. Could you imagine, Brother Wayne, anyone that would stand in today's world? And I think we've got some great spiritual leaders in the world around us today. We do. You know, not everybody's compromised. We've got some people who preach the gospel and stand in the, in the, uh, uh, you know, stand in the way of the world, and they promote uh, uh, light and salt, and, and they do a great job, and, and, uh, and I hope that the world hears the gospel message through them. But could you imagine anybody that would stand in the world today and said, uh, say, Brother Larry, it's not going to rain again until I say so, until my word. That's confidence in God. Amen. To the point where even James called him out as an example of, of what, uh, what power that a righteous man, uh, through the blessings and, and through the will of God, might uh, be able to yield. So Elijah was very powerful. We see that uh, because of his word, there was no rain for, uh, for three years. We see three separate times that Elijah was able to call down fire from heaven upon the enemies of himself, the enemies of God. And, and, and yet we see that this man had come to a point of discouragement. A wicked woman had vowed that she was going to take the life of Elijah if she could just get his hand, her hands upon him. And he ran for his life, is what the Bible tells us. You know, if Elijah can be broken and forgive the word, or if he can be disrupted, or if he can be vulnerable in that way, don't you think that all the rest of us are? Let me tell you, the answer to that is yes. Satan knows where you are vulnerable. He knows what would matter to you. He knows what is important to you. He knows where you great, great, most greatly value your blessings, and I think that's where he attacks everybody. I want to always believe that, you know, while we're strong, and we are strong, and I so much appreciate Brother Craig's message this morning, being full of power and being uh, led by the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mean that we're always bulletproof. There are times when things come to, into our life that just bring us to a point of desperation. Now, we look at that, and I think about the, the people that faced great uh, d adversity in the Word of God. Think about Job. Job was a great example of a man who absolutely did nothing wrong. In fact, God himself was complimentary towards Job, and yet Satan came after him uh, in, in such a vicious and a wicked way and just didn't relent and, you know, trying to break Job down. I think about Moses, and Moses, you know, uh, Moses had the, the three phases of his life, and, 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 and he was learning what he needed to learn, and, and, and God was preparing him for the first 40 years in, in Pharaoh's house, and, and then he was learning patience as a shepherd. And then you look at the last 40 years, and, and you look at what happened in Moses' life, the people that were with him and the victories that God gave him and the people that opposed Moses. Amen? to the point where, where it would have been very, uh, uh, very difficult for him to go forward. Yeah. Everybody has pain. And we see in the verses I read from, from uh, uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, that, that, uh, uh, that Elijah just, just, you know, when he got the word, he just decided that his best course of action in verse 3 is he went for his life. 
He tried to get away from those things that were opposing him. He, he, he tried to escape, as it were, the reach of Jezebel. And yet we see that even as he ran for his life, God was already working things out. And it wasn't over for, for Elijah. God had great things ahead of him, right? How many of us have been to a place in our life where we feel broken? Or it seems like everything is going wrong. Amen? Yeah. You, you can't buy three good uh, solid breaths in a row because, you know, everything is just, just heavy upon your chest. And we have to turn it over to Jesus. And we have to turn it over to God. And we have to say, God, whatever this thing is, I just need you to work it out. There's a great truth in this that everyone has pain. I don't care how spiritual you are, you will have pain. You will have difficulty of some type. And you think about the things that come into our lives. There are people here tonight and, and, uh, who endure great physical pain. Uh, I, I, we have a, a dear friend, uh, one of the sweetest ladies I know of on the face of this earth. Uh, she and her husband have been just so good to Cindy and myself uh, through the years. And, and uh, God took him uh, suddenly a few years ago. And, and, and this lady, uh, she just endures pain all the time. Uh, and maybe some of you are the same way. It doesn't matter. You know, you lay this way, you lay that way, you can't sleep. You stand up, it hurts. You sit down, it hurts. You lay down, it hurts. That is not a good thing. And I hope that one day somebody will develop a cure for all of that here on this earth. But the fact of the matter is, even if they don't, we'll have a cure from pain one day in heaven. The Bible said there'll never be another pill that's taken. There'll never be, you know, a, a, another moment with high blood pressure or, or surgery needed or what have you, that God's going to take away all the pain. He's going to make all things perfect, just like they were in the Garden of Eden until Adam sinned and fell short of the glory of God. But until that day, we're going to endure some pain. Some of it's going to be physical. Now, I want to touch on this tonight. I think that uh, sometimes, particularly within the church, particularly within the New Testament church, we see a lot of emotional pain. Now, what do I mean by that? It's the things that people can't see sometimes, the things that keep you up in the middle of the night that hurt you deeply, that cause you great pain. There's not a person here, and please take this in the right context, there's not a person here that's perfect. Every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. I had the opportunity when I was uh, doing the, the Bible study with the pastors in Honduras. Uh, it, it, it was a great event. We did this uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, and, uh, and people drove in, uh, pastors, and, and they brought people from their church. Uh, they drove in, you know, some of them drove an hour, an hour and a half in. And uh, myself and, and uh, uh, another uh, young man, another man who was uh, a teacher, uh, we shared the, the, the time. He would do half, I would do half. Uh, Ephraim did some of it. And I had the opportunity to share with them. We were talking about the way that we come to know Christ. We all come by the way of the cross. We're all saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. But you know, we usually come from different places in life. Brother Gary, some of the greatest Christians I've known were some of the meanest men in the world around them before they came to Christ. And when they tell you their story about how they came to, name, to know Christ, Brother Michael, they will talk about how wicked they were and about the incredible, incredible change that God made in their life. I've known some of them uh, to the point where, you know, you can't believe that they're civil, let alone that they're saved because of their background. And then there are other people who have come from, you know, an ideal family, and, and uh, they've always been good, right? I mean that complimentary. They've kind of always been good. They've always been, uh, 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 you, you know, listening to the Word of God. Maybe they've always been involved with church, uh, and they never really wandered out into the field of sin. And Brother Rick, i got to compliment that. I mean, you know, you just look at that and say, wow, that is, that is such a great testimony that God saved them from that position. The one who was wicked needed a Savior. The one who was uh, doing good and, you know, uh, uh, an upright person, they still needed a Savior. But here's the bottom line. I don't care which part of that range you came from. There are people that carry emotional scars and emotional pain. Never would ask for a show of hands, and I won't. But I wonder how many people, you know, they have somebody in their family who has been involved with something that was deeply against God and his word. 
Maybe there was a time when there was something and they robbed someone or, or they vandalized something or there was an accident and someone was killed or, or maybe there was uh, you know, something terrible. Maybe there was an abortion. All these things. And they're inside locked in somebody's head and they cause them pain. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Most of us have some area of our life that if we had a million dollars and we could pay that million dollars and we'd never live with that memory, never see it again, we'd give the money away. Amen? Amen. Most of us have some type of, type of a deep pain, a deep scar. Some of those scars, some of that pain is internal. Some of it is external. And in Elijah's uh, condition, that external pain of uh, Jezebel saying, I'm going to get you, caused him to run. Well, folks, I tell you what, the devil knows where you're vulnerable. Is that not true? And uh, I think about the warfare that he wages. In, uh, uh, it was about a month ago or so. Uh, we had uh, just a series of things that, was, that were going on in our house, and we knew it was Satan's attack. It, he, he bothered us, and, uh, you know, and, and, and there was some sickness, and he was attacking this family member and attacking this family member, and this wasn't going right, and, well, we couldn't fix that. And you had to turn it over to Jesus because you know that you just can't fix it on your own. Amen. So our message tonight is about Elijah, this strong, bold, courageous person who was a leader that God had his hand upon, uh, really almost like no other leader in, in the word of God. He was just anointed. He was amazing. Uh, in fact, God even allowed him later in the New Testament to, uh, to uh, be a part of the transfiguration of Christ to confer with Christ himself here upon earth. What a man this was. And yet his pain, his suffering, his concern caused him to go for his life and he came to this place that, uh, that he had found for himself. Now I want you to think about this. Elijah had just left behind the people of Israel who were praising God and singing Hosanna and, and hallelujah and he turned and he ran from that, right? Right? I wonder about how many times we do that in the church, that we start looking for a place where we can be comfortable with what's going on, amen? And it takes us in the wrong direction. You ever seen anybody that's like that? And they say, man, if I could have whipped back and, and made that choice differently, maybe I would not have left behind the church family that loved me. Maybe I wouldn't have left behind the pastor that cared so much for me. Maybe I shouldn't have left these things behind. But Elijah did what he thought he needed to do, and it just goes to show you that everybody can make a mistake. He looked at his own strength. He looked at his own direction. He started moving that way. He moved away from the things that God had just miraculously done, and it brought him to this place in the wilderness. Now, here's uh, part of our thought for this evening. If you look at the Word of God, the juniper tree is only mentioned twice in the Word of God, and it's only here by Elijah. Now, I'm not much, much of a uh, forester, you know, that type thing. I mean, uh, really, seriously, what I know about wood is, is very, very limited, that type thing. And I had to look up what is a juniper tree. And uh, we don't really have a lot of juniper trees around here. They, they kind of compared it maybe to a cedar. But you start looking at a juniper tree, and, you know, it does produce some berries, but it really doesn't produce a lot of fruit. And uh, most of the leaves are kind of uh, needle-like, that type of thing, so it produces some shade, but not a lot of shade. You start looking at this, and, and, and forgive me, but of the research I did, you can't really find anything that's very redeeming, Brother Gary, about a jun juniper tree. It's a pretty tree, but it just doesn't really like bring a lot of value, a lot of benefit to you. So this is where this great man of God ended up, <laughs> is under a tree in the middle of nowhere, crying out to God, saying things that, that, that were, you know, that were poor choices of words, if nothing else. And he had found a place that wasn't going to be able to help him to do what God had called him to do. The juniper tree was not a place of shelter. It was not a place of benefit. And I wonder if uh, Elijah didn't feel like because he'd traveled that distance and no one knew he was there except for God. Uh, you know, he'd left his, his uh, servant behind a day's journey. I wonder if he felt like he had distanced himself from his trouble and from the pain that he had felt inside. I'm going to tell you that uh, we came out of COVID and I thank God with, with, with a raised hand. He's been good to us. But I think we ran, uh, you know, as we... Uh, uh, as, as we as we went through this, there were people that decided that their juniper tree 
was to move away from church, to separate themselves from the people of God. And I wonder, you know, how many of those uh, are, are starting to get to the point where they're rethinking that decision. Let me tell you something, and I say this from 42 years of knowing God as my Savior. God facilitated and he established the church and he shed his blood uh, for the church and, and, and for the New Testament Christian. And he put us together as the family of God. We're a lot better off sticking together than we are separating and going it on our own. And I know that sometimes there are reasons, particularly physical, and people uh, feel like they, they, they have a, uh, you know, a, a, a risk there that's greater so they can't come to service. But I do worry about the people, Brother Rick, who run away from the Word of God, run away from the things of church, and, and, and think that maybe they've separated themselves from trouble, when really what they've done is they found a place where perhaps they're more vulnerable than any other place they could have found. There was no redeeming value in this tree that he had planned. Uh, and uh, again, didn't provide shade. If he would have stayed there, he would have withered. He would have died. Uh, there wasn't any nutritional value. It would not have protected him uh, in the case of a storm. And the Bible tells us that God looked upon him. And let me tell you what's not written here that we can read into this scripture is God showed him grace. And God showed him mercy. And God showed him that even though that's where he was under the juniper tree by his own choosing, that God was not through with him, that God was going to raise him up and do some amazing things with him in the years to come. Listen, everybody gets discouraged. Everybody gets to the point where they think, you know, can I go on, what have you? But God is able to strengthen when nobody else can. And he's able to revive when there is no other way. We see that in the words of grace that God has provided here. Look at uh, Elijah in verse 4. Look at his, his, his prayer to God. This man who had prayed and fire fell from heaven and, and this man who had raised the dead, you know, resurrection and, and had done these great miracles. Look at his words at the end of, chap, uh, at the end of uh, verse 4 in chapter 19. O Lord, take away my life for I'm not better than my father's. You think Elijah was in a place where he was wallowing in self-pity? He may have been under the juniper tree, but he was in the trough of his own self-depression. Listen to me, church, and I say this from experience. If you don't get much out of the, else out of the, the message tonight, I hope you'll get this. You can be your own worst enemy. We talk about walking in faith and trusting God for the things that we can't see. yes. We can trust him for our salvation. We can trust him to work out the, the difficulties in our life. Now, that doesn't mean you snap your fingers and everything's just perfect and, uh, you know, and, and the birds are singing and all that. But I'm telling you, if you can trust God with your soul and, and your eternal salvation, you can trust him with the details in your life. But how many times are we like this great man of God where we look towards God and we say, well, God, you know, I guess it's over. I guess I'm done, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I should have seen it coming. I, I deserve this. Now, I'm just going to lay down here and die. You know, have somebody come by later on and just shovel dirt over me. You know, th this is the end for me. And I, I'm saying that kind of flippantly, but you know what I'm saying is true. I've always been very blessed. I mean, you know, fortunately, I, I've always been clumsy, clumsiest guy in the world. In fact, I, I noticed when we were doing our cookout yesterday, the little white dog sat on the hill and watched the clumsiest guy in the world flip hamburgers. He's thinking, man, this is a good meal coming up. You know, this guy, how many will he drop? I didn't drop any, but I made sure the dog got some. I've always been clumsy, but I've been generally blessed with pretty good health that, you know, everybody gets sick and then you heal, right? And the body heals. But when I went down with the knee, it was unexpected, and it was pretty severe. And the biggest thing for me, Brother Gary, is the time I spent in, in, the, in the chair. Couldn't move. And Brother David, it caused me to spend a lot of time talking to God, reading my word. And by the way, that, that, that conversation, that prayer, usually starts with like, God, if I was doing something wrong, would you let me know? <laughs> I can't figure out, you know, I didn't choose to fall. I mean, you know, it's gravity. You made that and it pushed me to the ground. Uh, and now, now, you know, this knee's broken in five ways. I was doing these things for you. You know, what's the matter? And I was up at night. I mean, I couldn't rest. I uh, couldn't sleep. And, you know, you get to the point where you think I've done something to deserve 
what's happened to me here. Listen, Elijah had served God. He had just done a great, great, great miracle to demonstrate that God, Jehovah, Yahweh, was, was the only God, right? And, and, and he was able to, to destroy uh, the false God of, uh, of Baal and his prophets. Sometimes things are going to happen to you in your life. And in that place, you have to look towards God and say, I don't understand exactly what's happening, but I want to be okay with it. It's an unwise prayer when we look at God and say, hey, God, you know, why don't you just, and then you fill in the blank. My mother-in-law is uh, such a sweetheart, and, and she, uh, she, she trusts us to help her look after things in her house. And uh, she told me a couple of weeks ago, she said, uh, we were going to Harmony Church, and, and uh, she goes with us sometimes. She, she said, my, uh, my light is on in my car, you know, for the, for the low tire pressure. Well, you know, didn't really think much about it. Didn't really, you know, Brother Gary didn't sound alarming, so I didn't do anything about it until Cindy came home the other night and said, "Well, you know, the tire's got it's pretty flat. It's, it has a little air in it, but not much." I went to look at it and we fixed the tire. And I told my mother-in-law, I said, "Anytime that light comes on, take it to this place that always services your car." She said, "Well, what do I tell them?" I said, "Just pull in and tell them the light's on." Let them figure out what's wrong with it, right? How many times do we have something that goes wrong in our life? Listen to me, church. And we say, God, here's what you need to do to fix this. Elijah said, hey, just take my life, right? Am I better than my father? How many times are we all guilty of that as saying, God, I got something going on here. It's a real problem. Let me tell you how I think this should be fixed. Could you take notes, please, and work this out just the way I'm going to describe it to you? Elijah did that. And we're all prone to do that too. Why? Because we want the pain to go away. We want everything to be good and and, and normal again. So this place that was isolated in the wilderness, you look at pictures of it that, that, that have been drawn through the ages and, you know, there's Elijah on his knees and there's nothing around except this big, you know, uh, 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 tree, gnarly looking tree, you know, that's above him. Um, And sometimes we get that. There's no redeeming virtue in that tree. There's no redeeming virtue in staying in that place. We went to the wilds. There were, uh, you know, a couple, a few couples that went, and uh, it was a blessing. By the way, I hope that that we'll go back to the wilds again. If Jesus doesn't come, that's about 100 days from now that the wilds begins again. And in about 100 days, I hope we'll get some folks to go back with us. But, you know, I've heard a lot of messages and there was a man that spoke, and he really hit home for me, church, when he talked about the lies that we allow ourselves to believe. Yeah. You let that sink in. The lies that we allow ourselves to believe. Through my many years of, uh, of, of knowing God and just being involved with people, I've had people come to me. And they said, well, you know, I, I had this situation in my life and, 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 and you know, I had this uh, uh, marriage and it didn't work out and, and, and all these, and, you know, I don't think God can use me. Well, where did you learn that? God has a great use for everybody. And the things that, that have happened to us in the past are always not the defining course that God uses us for in the future. In fact, a few weeks ago, I heard a uh, preacher and he brought a great message And he said, the things that are the greatest challenges, the greatest problems, the greatest things that we overcome in our life, those become the testimony of God's grace in our life. Is that not true? What God helps us to overcome becomes that thing that we share with other people. And we say, let me tell you about what God did in this circumstance. If we're not careful, we'll lie under the juniper tree We'll think that our walk with God is over, and the only thing that's left for us is, is, is death or uh, discouragement or whatever word you want to use, the lies that we allow ourselves to believe. So we've looked at the person. We've looked at the pain that brought him there. We've looked at this place, and now I want to look at the plan, and we'll be finished. So Elijah called out, and God answered his prayer. Now, I want you to notice, the Bible tells us here in these verses that God responded to Elijah by sending an angel. And this angel was able to help him in a supernatural way. 
The Bible tells us in verse 4 that, that, uh, uh, that Elijah says, take away my life. In verse 5, as he lay and he slept uh, under a juniper tree, behold, then, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals and, uh, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and he drank uh, and he laid him down again. God will nourish us with the thing that we need just at exactly the right time if we'll listen. I, I was uh, thinking, and, and uh, uh, you know, this, this wonderful young man was talking about some tapes that he had of Brother Jack. And I told him, you know, if Brother Vinoy finds out he's got tapes of Brother Jack's preaching, he'll be real popular here. Listen, I don't care if it's Brother Jack. I have, uh, I have uh, books written by, um, uh, you know, Oliver B. Green, and uh, I have some old books by, you know, Billy Graham and uh, someone years and years ago gave, gave me a collection of, of uh, you know, uh, old uh, uh, sermons and that type of things from the 1950s and 1960s. God will speak to us. He will send water. He will send the cake, bacon on coals, right? If we will let him speak to us through his word. But here's one of the concerns I have. Sometimes we get to the point where we just want to die under the juniper tree. So we look at, you know, we look towards the heaven and say, God, I guess this is it. We put our hands over our ears. We, you know, we put our hands over our eyes and, and no, 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 I can't hear you, God. And we just want to stay there. It's almost like we want to prove God wrong when he wants to help us in so many ways. I enjoyed Brother Craig's message this morning, and he talked about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And I absolutely agree with something that he said that was so important. Now, you take this in whatever context you want. But I'm concerned that the New Testament church has become afraid of the move of the Spirit of God. That we've gotten to the point where we say, well, look at that group and look what they do, what have you. Hey, why don't we look towards the cross? <laughs> why don't we look towards the day of Pentecost? You know, why don't we look towards the great move of God that he did in the life of all of his servants that we can see and say, you know, God, just come and work in my life. Lead me in the path that you would have me to go. I don't want to die under the, uh, under the juniper tree. I want to be revived. I want to eat from the, from the food that you offer me. I want to get strength from your word. I want to have the, 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 the water, not just the cruise of the water, of, uh, you know, at my head, but the, the water of life. And I want it to flow from me like a river. Sometimes we have to get up from that place of the juniper tree and say, hey, I need to walk a day back and pick up the guy left there at the edge of the wilderness. And then I need to walk back to town and I need to face Jezebel or I need to face whatever it was. God's plan here was that he was going to strengthen Elijah. And then what was he going to do? Well, you forgive me for simplifying the, the, the message, but he told, uh, uh, he told uh, Elijah to get up and move. It's time for you to move on. It's time for you to continue the work that I have got set up before you. This angel said, strengthen yourself that you can move on for the things that God has before you. Elijah's ministry was certainly not over. His life was not over. In fact, the Bible tells us that God was going to gloriously take Elijah to heaven in a chariot of fire one day. Could you, do you think the guy laying under the juniper tree, Brother Gary, he could have seen all that? Well, let's see, I'm going to give you Elijah to work with you, right? You're going to train him. And you're going to go anoint this man to be king. And then you're going to do these things. Oh, and by the way, not going to tell you this, Elijah, but, but there will be a point where I'm going to speak to you again and you're going to prophesy yeah. the, the, the death of this wicked woman that's chasing you, right? You understand what I'm saying? The best was still ahead. The best was to come. God was not finished with, with Elijah. But don't we get to that point where we see people around us and Brother Gary, they've just gotten comfortable under the juniper tree. They, they say, uh, you know, what can God do? Let me answer that question. God can do anything. God can do everything. He can open blinded eyes. He can strengthen the, the, the weakened legs. Uh, he's, he's demonstrated he can raise the dead. He can do it physically, and he can uh, revive us spiritually when we look to him. We've got to walk forward in the strength that God has prepared for us. I want you to turn, just uh, as I close this, this evening, to the book of 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. 
we looked at this great man of God, that, uh, that uh, uh, Elijah, that God had used so mightily, and how God had, had, had used him to, to prophesy and to uh, uh, promote his word, to preach his word, and to be an influence in the world around him. Well, we're going to finish this evening in the book of 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, by looking at another great man that God used, and of course his name was Peter. Now Peter, writing this, uh, this epistle, had, uh, had many things to say, short, short epistle, wonderful words, and I want to read a few verses for you, and I want you to think about the juniper tree. In 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 6, Peter wrote this, he said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Look at verse 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And he goes on, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now let me stop right there, and I want to read another verse or two. You know what Peter's saying? We've got to be careful because we're all going to end up at the juniper tree at some point. We're all going to face that, that choice of being discouraged. We're all going to face that situation, and the devil's going to come after you. You might as well just expect it, but it doesn't mean that he will be victorious. Peter said he's seeking whom he may devour, but he doesn't say that, he, uh, that Satan's going to get it done. We go on and look at verse 10. But the God of all grace, that unmerited favor of God, grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Elijah's testimony was one of great faith, great usefulness to God. God just had his hand upon him, put his stamp upon his ministry sometimes we look at great people like that and they think man they, they were never like us you know they they never got discouraged they never they never had their their you know to to have their faith challenged what have you and the truth is nothing's farther from the truth we're pretty much all the same in a lot of ways may, may, maybe a little bit different in some ways but we do face the challenges and church I appreciate y'all being here on a Sunday night and you talk about preaching to the choir. I really am. But most of us probably rub elbows with family, with friends, with people that once walked in the path that God had called them to. Amen? Yeah. And they're not walking in that path anymore. Now, I don't know how long that uh, Elijah was under the juniper tree. I don't think it was a long time. But I do believe that we need to be sensitive to the fact that there are people that are probably under the juniper tree and they've been there for a while. They need the voice of God to lead them out of that path and it could be that they need a friend, someone like us, to be an encouragement to them and to tell them that God loves them and even when days are bad and things are going wrong, it doesn't mean that he's shortened his hand and pulled away from them. This juniper tree is a dangerous place. Would you say amen to that? And we don't want to set up camp under the juniper tree. And in fact, we want to help people, particularly our own family, our own loved ones, to escape from that place. Miss Laura, would you come and play for us? Uh, and if you'll come and, and just uh, prepare to play, that would be a blessing. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment, please. Lord, I do thank you for the privilege to be here this evening. Lord, to bring this message. And God, I know it's an unusual thought from a very familiar text. But God, I just pray that you've worked in somebody's heart tonight. Perhaps, Lord, there's one whose heart is just broken because of how many things have gone wrong in their life. Maybe there's one here tonight, Lord, that we can't see those wounds. We, we don't understand what's happened. But they just look at all the circumstances around them and say, Wow, God, you know, I know you love me. But man, I sure could use a, to feel a little bit of that right now could use a bit of break from the pain. Lord, could you help me to get away from this place that uh, life has brought me to, this place I've run to? It's certainly no escape, and it's, don't, it's, it's not where I want to live. 
I want to get away from this place and get back to the place that you've called me to be. Lord, I ask for your blessings upon this congregation. Lord, I ask for these people that I believe, uh, Lord, certainly almost all of them know you as their Savior, that you'll help them to walk with great courage, great power, great strength in the way that you would have them to go. Lord, these things we ask in your blessed name. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'll stand this evening. I brought the